All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. Same course, different room, hopefully a much improved room for you all. This is lecture one, PHP. So last week we began with a bit of a crash course in things like XHTML and CSS, the hopes of which are to level the playing field, so to speak. And Project Zero, recall, is, exa is about exactly that as well. But it's tonight when we begin the dynamism of the course, the dynamic in bu building dynamic websites. And we'll focus on this language known as PHP. So, uh, we began last week by focusing on the sort of context for all of this stuff. And that was this picture here. So in layman's terms, if you will, what is HTTP? You have a picture, but no outright definition this time. So what is it? A uh, transfer protocol. OK, so protocol. Let me push a little harder. What does that mean? Yeah, so it's uh, uh, agreed upon principles that client and server uh, will use in order to communicate. So the example we saw of this last week is that when a client like IE or Firefox makes a request for a web page, it looks like get and then the, the part of the URL, specifically the path to the file that they want, followed by HTTP slash 1.0 or 1.1 based on the version. And then the server obviously responds with the answer, namely the contents of that web page. Well, Today we'll begin focusing on exactly how those contents can be generated using PHP. So the web server that we'll be using throughout this semester is this thing called Apache. So if you've ever heard of Apache or HTTPD, the HTTP daemon, which just means server, this is perhaps the most popular uh, web server product out there for a variety of reasons. It's very high performing uh, and it's very inexpensive, that is free. So this is the A in LAMP. So Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP is one of the frameworks that we'll be focusing on this course. And the A is, again, Apache. Um, and it's simply part of a very common setup. So that's all that LAMP is, incidentally. Those of you who recall reading the description for this course or who, or who are here to learn LAMP, well, you're not really here to learn LAMP, which is really just buzzwords for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, which is just very commonly used in conjunction with one another. So we have installed on CS75.net a Linux box Apache web server. In fact, it's hard to set up Linux on a box these days without getting Apache with it or without at least being able to install it easily. And we're going to be using one of the newest versions, 2.2, documentation for which is pretty good and available online. So let's make this more real now. How is CS75.net working? Which in and of itself is not such an interesting question because who really cares how Harvard has structured its virtual private server for its students. But again, recall from last week, it's meant to be representative of a web server that you yourselves might run at uh, one's office that you yourselves might contract with via DreamHost or some other host. So how is this working? Well, we have just one machine. And in fact, we don't even have that. It's one virtual machine. Uh, but on that machine is running this web server called Apache. Uh, Apache is designed to listen for HTTP requests, and it's designed to respond to those requests. Now, those of you with more of a networking background, an HTTP server typically runs on what TCP port? All right, so 80. And 80 is the number that uniquely identifies a web service typically on a server as opposed to email service or SSH or FTP or the like. So my site that we put on here last week, mailinrouge.com, is also being hosted on the same box that Dan's site is being hosted and Daniel's and the other teaching fellows as well as all of the students in this room, assuming you filled out that survey for Project Zero already. So our server, recall, has but one small white lie for tonight's purposes, but one IP address. And the astutes can tell me actually right now what that IP address is. That's right. So that should not change throughout the course of the semester. So if you'd like to tuck that away, by all means do, though you shouldn't have to. But what this represents here, this XML-like fragment, is actually an excerpt from an HTTPD configuration file. So the most common really the configuration file that one tends to focus on when setting up his or her own web server, or even if you've contracted with a third party but nonetheless have access to their configuration files, there's typically this file called HTTP, uh, httpd.conf. So that's the file. Where you find this on a system can sometimes vary. But if I go ahead and uh, become root on cs75.net, what I'll now have is more unfettered access to all of the files on this machine. And it turns out that a typical place uh, is in this path here. So in Etsy, HTTPD, 
con for all of the configuration files typically for a web server. Now, this is interesting because, one, it's very useful to know these kinds of things when you want to troubleshoot a problem, whether you're developing sites in PHP or frankly, most any other language that's supported by an Apache web server. But you can also add and remove features, not only to the whole web server, but also on a per user and a per directory basis. And in fact, that's where we're going with this discussion, because for the course, have we, manu uh, have we automatically generated uh, fragments of configuration like this that configure your specific website according to some standards we decided upon in advance. So this is the kind of stuff that you would find in an httpd.conf uh, file. So all this kind of stuff is documented online. And we won't focus so much on configuration options, but rather if things come up over the course of the semester like, how do I do this? Or why is my website giving me this error? We may on occasion turn to some of these things so that you can uh, post uh, after this course, diagnose these kinds of problems on your own. But for instance, just to, um, let's see, just to give you an example of what's going on in here. So what's a good one to put in here? OK, how about, how about this one here? So right now. This directive in this configuration file is pretty much saying that starting from the root of the hard drive, go ahead and enable all options. Now, what do those options mean? We'll sort of tease apart over time. But this is a very loose way of saying, you know what, by default, give everyone all possible Apache options, which you yourselves will be able to modify within your own configuration files. I'm looking at the master file. You'll be able to override these things yourself. But what this is saying is, and well, this will become relevant as we use certain options in the course, Go ahead and allow them all. By contrast, and those of you familiar with um, HT access files, which if you're not already, you will be probably after tonight, HT access files and similar .ht files often by design of Apache need to be world readable so that the web server and other users can potentially look at those files. But you don't really want random people off of the internet looking at some of your internal configuration details for a variety of reasons, some of which are compelling security-wise. So take a guess as to what this fragment of code here is doing. What's this fragment? It's a little dark to see here, but at least the middle, you can kind of guess what might be going on here. Deny from all. So that's a very powerful statement that is simply saying, based on this directive, go ahead and if anyone on the internet tries to access a file whose file name starts with .ht, and this is an example of a, a regular expression of sorts that we'll revisit over the course of the semester, deny from all. Just do not let other users on the internet see these kinds of things. So I point these out now, not because we're going to dwell on them for tonight's purposes, but just to give you a starting point when it comes time to configure your own server or solve, troubleshoot problems yourselves, that's one of the files to take a look at. But because we are hosting so many websites on the course's web server, it would not be very fun if every time we wanted to add one of you to the course's web server, if we had to go in with Emacs or whatnot and edit that file by copying and pasting the most recently added student's configuration, changing a few lines so that it's your domain and not theirs. So this is why we're using um, direct admin, recall, the web control panel for all of the course, because that control panel, even though it's giving you a very pretty interface to what otherwise is a fairly standard um, CentOS Linux installation on our virtual server, it is what's modifying all of these files for you, sort of automagically, if you will, and for us too, because it's a time-saving technique. So when we go ahead and create an account for each of you, say Mail and Rouge, like I did last week, what this is defining, as you might infer, is what's called a virtual host. Right, so gone are the days, for the most part, where you can only want run one web server on one physical box. Rather, you can virtually host as many of these websites as you might want, subject only to performance issues. So what this is saying to Apache, because this, again, is an excerpt from my own configuration file, which I, the user, can't modify, but David, the staff member with root access, could modify, is saying, go ahead and declare a virtual host on this server's IP address, specifically on port 80. And that line is going to be identical for everyone else in this course just because we're running everyone's on the same server. But how is it then that when I pull up this web server, cs75.net, ultimately by way of its IP address, how does the server distinguish a request for mailinrouge.com's index.html versus cs75.net's index.html file? Well, what did we say last week? How does the web server distinguish 
two otherwise identical requests. I'm sorry? Yeah, so recall the get request, besides just saying get slash index.html, one or more lines down also said host colon, and then it specified the fully qualified domain name, the domain name, mailinrouge.com or www.mailinrouge.com, and provided the browser did in fact do that, which any major browser today should do, what that's providing to the web server is a hint as to which virtual host it should be routing this request to. That is, whose public HTML directory should field this request. So in Apache's configuration file here, it's this line here that's saying that this virtual host's server name is www.mailinrouge.com. It's that single line there that's teaching Apache, if you will, how to distinguish a request for my website versus yours, or any of yours for that matter. Now what about this here? So a server alias, you can sort of infer here, but why is this a useful line to put in this config? That way you get, you can go HTTP mailing rules or HTTP dub, 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 mail. Perfect. So it's this line, and we'll see in a moment, in conjunction with one other useful, uh, necessary configuration that allows me to visit this site via mailinrouge.com, which is nice and fast to type, and also the more conventional, perhaps, www.mailinrouge.com. And a common question in setting up one's website is how do you go about doing that? In fact, if I go ahead and go to harvard.edu, this never ceases to amaze me. I give you harvard.edu. I give you www.harvard.edu. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, rather than just complain about this every semester, I should probably email someone and let them know. Actually, I know we have a couple students in FAS Computer Services here, so maybe I should be gentler here and hope they route this to the appropriate uh, powers that be here. I know, I know it's not FAS's, but uh, presumably you have friends in higher places than I do. But what that boils down to is any number of a couple of things, one of which might very well be something fairly simple like this. Um, also possible is a DNS configuration thing, which we'll take a look at, or something else that I'm not even thinking of. But either way, it's sort of unfortunate that uh, you know, anyone in this world might want to visit Harvard's uh, website. All right, I'm guessing it's harvard.edu. Dead end. So, all right, I guess I really should email someone tomorrow about this. Um, <laughs> seeing as we shame the university on film now to the rest of the world. All right, so what else is going on here? So server admin, you can post in an email address for the appropriate contact. Um, this is the sort of uh, address that spit out sometimes in error messages at the bottom of the page when it says contact webmaster at. Well, it's there sometimes that that information can be pulled from. So document root now is interesting because this will vary by student in this class. So what this is telling Apache is for the server, for the virtual host being run on this server's IP address on that port that happens to be called mailinrouge.com or www the same, look to this path on the local file system for index.html or index.php or mailinrouge.jpg. In other words, use this as the base directory against which all URLs will be resolved. So there you sort of see the magic as to how we're running multiple websites on the same box because each of them have different routes and the way the web server figures out where to go for the appropriate content is by way of the host name that's provided in the HTTP request. Now this is some interesting stuff we'll come back to in a moment, this SU exec user group. And then this stuff is useful as well. So I dare say that one of the most useful features of direct admin, as you will see this year, is that it makes it very easy for you all to access your error logs. Because if you're like me, you will make mistakes from time to time to time. And it's very e useful to be able to pull up Apache's error logs, which are sometimes more useful, than, as we'll see, than say just PHP. Because sometimes something's wrong with your code, and what does PHP tell you? Well, not even, and that's the catch. Nothing whatsoever, right? But someone's got to know why I just got a blank page back, and often it's the web server that can provide some hints. So you'll see via your control panel, and we'll likely pull this up tonight, that you can look at your own logs um, to see what the in potentially informative error message might be. So finally, we come to this thing here, which is very similar in structure to the thing I showed you in that base configuration file, the one that affects everyone's uh, uh, web server setups. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, just because I can't go back and forth with it, mm -hmm. could you be more verbal about this thing here? Ah, sure. 
Sure. So over here at the bottom of this configuration file where it says open bracket directory, what we have here is a further refinement of those options that we said earlier are just pretty、uh, hand wavy. That is, allow all options to function. Again, we'll come in the future to what these options can be. But what this is telling Apache is for any files in this particular directory path, Go ahead and enable all options. Turns out this is redundant in this context here. But then turn on the SUPHP engine, and the SUPHP、uh, user group should be Malin Malin. So this is actually going to be particularly useful for us for security reasons. But before we turn our attention to that point, let me go ahead and come back to That whole dub 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 issue before we go、uh, forge ahead too far. So, you will notice that on cs75.net, going to both cs75.net whisks you away to the course's homepage, as does dub dub dub.cs75.net, enter. But where did I end up? If you can see the small font with that last transaction. All right, so cs75.net. And this is sort of a stylistic thing, religious thing, call it what you want. But I, just because I like the succinctness of cs75.net, but I want to let people visit www.cs75.net. But once they're there, I want to sort of standardize what all of the URLs look like, if for no other reasons than aesthetics. How do you do that? Because that's not actually that uncommon of a desire, particularly if you have the marketing folks in a company sort of telling the engineers how to configure the website. So, how might this be done? Well, first of all, cs75.net and www.cs75.net are they hosted on the same or different IP addresses? All right, so same. Sorry, it's as are any of your websites. So that must mean that somehow cs75.net and www.cs75.net have to be quote unquote resolving to the same IP address. And what was the system that does this resolution of names to IPs and vice versa? So this was DNS. So let me go ahead now and pull up panel.cs75.net. And incidentally, we can now sort of tease apart why in Project Zero we parenthetically mentioned, oh, by the way, when you visit panel.cs75.net, you're actually going to be redirected to https colon slash slash and then colon 2222. The folks who wrote direct admin decided by default that their panel interface would be run not on port 80 or 443, but on 22. Two, two. They had thousands of options available to them. They chose this one, but rather than have you all remember that, I'll actually show you in a moment how it is we let you just type panel.cs75.net and get redirected. And again, hopefully, the, the motivation for this in your minds is not who really cares how the course website is functioning, but rather that these are representative tricks that a lot of folks like to employ for themselves. So I'm going to go ahead and log in now.、Uh, let me go ahead and do it with Malin Rouge because the example is the same. So, I'm going to log into a panel with my own student like account. And recall that one of the things you have access to in your panel is this DNS management link. So, when I click on this DNS management link, what you'll see, like we discussed last week, are a bunch of DNS records for your domain. And we have automatically created some of these for you. And if you're feeling adventurous and know, think you know what you're doing, you can go ahead and modify this over time.、Um, but certainly out of the box, we wanted everything standardized. So, the fact that mailinrouge.com resolves to 64.131.79.130 is the direct result of there being, recall, this A record in my DNS tables mapping mailinrouge.com to that IP address. And recall this syntactic detail, even though domain names don't have dots at the end of the TLD, in these configuration files、uh, for a DNS server called Bind, Berkeley Internet Name Database,、um, the convention is simply to make Clear that this is a full domain and not just a host name by appending that dot to it. So it's not a typo, it's very much intentional. But the fact that I can also type www.mailinrouge.com is a direct result of my also having this A record saying that www. whatever the current domain is should also resolve to that same IP address. And now, tragically, this demo failed last time、uh, until maybe five minutes after we took that break. But supernews.mailinrouge.com, if I may, let me、uh, risk putting my foot in my mouth yet again. Supernews.mailinrouge.com.、Uh, this is a website that I've been working on over the course of the week. And you'll notice it's very similar 
to CNN.com, but and it's always bad to bring up a news site because everyone starts reading the headlines, right, and zoning out. But notice, if you will, just the URL. So CNN could actually be preventing this by doing something similar to the trick I'm doing by redirecting www.cs75.net back to cs75.net. But I presume for reasons of oversight or just performance, they don't even bother doing that. But this is just a simple little DNS trick. But I would wager that most websites wouldn't work as easily. For instance, you couldn't map your own host name to, say, one of the, your fellow students in this course because they're on the same box. And we are doing those checks against what the host names are or at least should be. So to be clear then, this DNS entry, which back in the day one would just use Pico or Vim or Emacs to edit at the command line on a Linux or Unix system, changing some fairly esoteric um, lines of code, Direct Admin is still doing that, but giving you a prettier GUI with which to do it. Okay? So the fact that we have www and mailinrouge.com both as A records pointing to that IP address means that at least at the network level, so at the IP level, will both of those uh, names resolve to the same IP address. Now once we've resolved to the same IP address, whose job is it though to figure out where to route that request on the local box? So that's Apache, and therein lies the motivation for the configuration we looked at. And for the curious, this incidentally is what a typical uh, bind configuration file looks like. Uh, Named.conf and similar files, Named being the, the name server daemon, just like HTTPD is the HTTP daemon. This is something I pulled off of CS75.net because this is just the text file that direct admin is automatically creating for us. But again, back in the day, you would manually edit this. And frankly, if I really wanted to, I could go in and manually edit this now. But this is perhaps not a lesson in well-designed files. Right? You can sort of, uh, you kind of have to infer the structure. So, 10 years old. 30 years old. OK, in fairness, but um, uh, we won't get into any uh, religious debates or the like there. Yes, there's certainly historical reasons behind it and years of, of uh, legacy. All right, so now the web server's gotten some requests. Get slash index.html, HTTP slash 1.0. So that's the request that's come in, in addition to that host colon line in the HTTP request. Now the web server Apache has to decide to whom to route it. Well, based on the configuration file we had up a moment ago, this config which is being loaded into memory when we boot up our server, tells Apache what directory to look in now, specifically this one. And it's in my public HTML directory, directory that all my files, like yours, live. But what if I do the following? If I become Malin again and go into public HTML, let's see if I've actually done it here. Yep. So notice that I'm in my public HTML directory. If I do an ls, you'll see two files that I uploaded in that demo last week, index.html and that JPEG. The lectures directory is new for tonight. But if I do ls-a, which many of you know means list all of the files in the current directory, by default, Linux doesn't usually show you so-called dot files, files beginning with a period. But if you take a look with ls-a, you see all such files. And now if I use my favorite text editor, like vi or vim, to open this file, you'll see that I've done two things with my configuration. One, I've turned on what are called indexes, but we'll ignore that for tonight's purposes. But it's these next three lines that are the magic. And we're using it for a very simple thing. This so-called rewrite engine capability of Apache is wonderfully powerful for a variety of reasons. More compelling, perhaps, than this aesthetic detail is that if you ever decide to restructure a website, and by that I mean you relocate where your content is into different directories, renaming files, maybe switching from .cgi files to .php files, you don't want the entire internet world, all, many of whom use Google to find your pages, to all of a sudden reach dead ends overnight. So if you can think of a mapping between your old file names and directory names to the new ones, such that you could write a little script, for instance, to convert one to the other, well, Apache's rewrite engine allows you to do exactly that. You can take an incoming URL, parse it using regular expressions, which we'll revisit over the course of the semester, and then change that URL to be the new URL. So you don't need to output instead these silly links like, this page has moved. Please visit this address instead. You can do that all transparently to the user. And you can send back a response, in fact, that well-designed search engines like Google will sort of realize that, oh, they've relocated their content. Let me update my own search database so that you're not forever doing this rerouting. Yeah. So 
So it's a good question to repeat for the camera. Is this not um, um, bad, bad, uh, a bad approach over time? Because you certainly don't want to start littering your configuration files with all of these directives. So I would say absolutely. I mean, there comes a point and there comes a number of months after which all of these tweaks might become more headache than it's worth. And arguably, there's a performance hit that you take when every URL has to be rewritten. Because what this involves, as we'll see in a second, is an actual redirection. When you rewrite URLs in the manner we're about to see, what's really happening is you're not just changing the URL that the user sees, you're rather responding to their original request for index.html and saying instead, hey, go find it at this URL instead. So you're now doubling the number of requests that have to come through. But certainly for short-term solutions, and when this is a better solution than just letting the user reach a dead end, it's certainly um, manageable. So I would say there, there does come a judgment call at some point. So how is it working? So I decided arbitrarily that I wanted everyone in the world, whether they typed www.mailinrouge.com or just went to mailinrouge.com, I want them to end up at www.mailinrouge.com. Well, how do we do this? Well, in this HT access file, which all of you have the privileges, so to speak, to create in your own public HTML directory, can you do tricks like this and also enable certain options over the course of the semester? Some of you may never need to touch this, but you should know if you like this kind of stuff and want to start playing games uh, with your scripts and with URLs that you'll have this ability. So first, I uh, typed in this directive telling Apache, for this directory and all of public HTML subdirectories, turn on the rewrite engine. That just enables me to use the following two lines. This first line is a condition. That's sort of a weird looking condition. It's not like C or Java, but rather it's just this statement, rewrite condition. And then it's a percent sign, curly brace, HTTP underscore host, close curly brace. So that denotes a variable, an environment variable, that Apache makes available to your own code, your PHP files, as well as to these HT access files. After that, we're saying bang, which typically means not in most programming languages. Uh, the uh, little caret symbol, which in regular expression speak means start matching from the beginning of the variable. And then we see www.mailinrouge.com, dollar sign, and C. So what is this saying? Ultimately, this is saying if the current HTTP host does not equal in its entirety from first character to last character, www.mailinrouge.com, go ahead and rewrite the URL as http colon slash slash www.mailinrouge.com dollar sign one. Well, what's this dollar sign one? Well, this little trick here by putting parentheses followed by dot star means capture anything that was after the dot com slash in the URL that the user tried to visit store it automatically in a variable called dollar sign one so that I, HT access, can append the path that the user requested to the end of this new partial URL. Now to make this more real, let's do this. If I go back to my browser for a moment and I go to mailinrouge.com index.html, notice that I was automatically redirected to www.mailinrouge.com slash index.html. Well, now suppose I didn't really know what I was doing and I was just kind of futzing around and wanted to make sure this was really doing something. Let's use our old friend, cnn.com. Okay, so now I'm going to go to mailinrouge.com slash index.html, enter, and voila, this time I get redirected to www.cnn.com. Now, I can take a complete guess and redirect someone anywhere, but what's more interesting, what's going on underneath the hood? Well, rather than play with IE here, let me go ahead and open up Firefox, because again, as we linked on the course's software page, there's this wonderful plugin you can install called Live HTTP Headers, which shows you what's really going on behind the scenes. So let's leave things as CNN.com for a moment, just to be clear, and see what's happening. So if I in Firefox go to mailinrouge, dot com slash index.html because I have this plugin open and this again is useful for debugging not real-time production purposes this is gonna sniff all of the HTTP traffic going from browser to server and back so I'm gonna hit enter I get up the day's news I don't care what the content is what I care about 
is what's in here. Now that's a heck of a lot of content, but as we said last week, because web pages typically have those ahrefs and img src's, there's a lot of content that's referenced inside an HTML page. And so what a browser is supposed to do is after parsing, say, index.html, it's supposed to recursively go and get all of that, or iteratively go and get all of that content as well. We only care about the first request or two. So let's scroll all the way to the top and ignore the rest. And you'll see that the first thing that my browser sent, and it's a little small, but it's just literally what I typed a moment ago. Here are the other headers which Firefox decided would be good practice to send. I don't really care about those, but what I do care about is the response. So notice that in this response here, and this, they separated this plugin by just a single blank line. Here's the response. It looks like the server responded with a 301 message. Now, many of you are probably familiar with HTTP 404 messages and 500 messages, uh, 401 messages, file not found, internal server error, uh, forbidden. Well, 301 is the moved permanently response. And what this is telling your browser, or better yet, Google, the URL you just tried to visit has actually moved permanently to this other address. What is that other address? Well, it returns a location colon line. And that quite simply tells Google, tells the browser where to go find this data. Now, if the browser is implementing HTTP correctly, it should receive this header and say, OK, I tried once, didn't find the content where it should be, but I've been informed it's now at this URL. And IE or Firefox should make a second request to now this URL to go fetch that same content. And so here is that second request. Here now is going to be the response. But from which server should this response now be coming? CNN. So this is one of those codes that uh, it's a shame you don't see more often, because it actually means everything is OK. But if you get back a 200 response, that means, great, here you go. Here comes some content, unlike the 404s and the 401s that tend to cause headaches. Yeah? dub 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 dot xxx dot com okay gonna avoid doing that for demo purposes <laughs> but i'm not sure what the question is Ah, OK, so let me respin it away from the XXX domain, but let's do supernews.mailandrouge.com, which is an analogous example if I follow correctly. So suppose now that I'm actually CNN's webmaster, and I'm sick and tired of people at Harvard creating their own faux websites and claiming it as their daily news. So what I want to do on CNN's web server is say that, well, if the HTTP host in some request does not equal CNN.com, for instance, it equals supernews.mailinrouge.com or whatever, what I want to redirect them to now is this. Or if I, all, if I know that I don't really care about a lot of adversaries, all I know is that Mailin at this course is redirecting supernews.mailinrouge.com to my site, I don't have to do this all-inclusive not. I can just more specifically say if the host actually equals supernews.mailinrouge.com and thereby special case that. So if the host equals supernews, well then grab whatever the file path is that the user requested, but append it to my canonical URL, www.cnn.com. So in other words, using these kinds of tricks, could CNN actually be standardizing the URLs and now also preventing someone like me from redirecting as such? And I should actually, let me make one tweak because we're using regular expressions here. I kind of cheated. Dot actually signifies any character. So if I escape it with the backslash operator, now it's saying look for a little literal period. Though the probability of something else matching was probably pretty low. Yeah. Okay. Now in these square brackets at the end of these lines, I understand the R equals 301. That's sort of self-explanatory. What about the NC and the L? Excellent. Can anyone guess what NC might denote? Right, so no case, so, or I think that non-case sensitive. So NC just means even if the user types supernews.mailinrouge.com, that too is perfectly OK. Go ahead and match the string independent of case. So that's useful because DNS, we haven't mentioned this, and by default I've been typing everything in lowercase, even though we appreciate those of you who yelled at us in your surveys by typing your uh, survey data in all capital letters. DNS, case sensitive or insensitive? 
So it's not sensitive. So the browser, maybe it would just force everything to lowercase, probably shouldn't even bother because DNS doesn't care, but web servers might. And so what this is saying is ignore the case, however, the request comes in, and just treat it case insensitively. But I will tease apart these last couple lines here in square brackets. So it's this last line, the rewrite rule, that effectively is saying the buck stops here. If the previous condition or conditions have evaluated to true, go ahead and exercise this rule. Well, this rule is again saying grab everything after the HTTP host and append it to that URL and then return the HTTP code 301. And this is in contrast to 302 primarily, which if you took a look at GoDaddy's interface, which we didn't require you to, but GoDaddy actually has this domain forwarding feature whereby they will just automatically, uh, if you sign up on mailinrouge.com, but you don't host it on cs75.net, but you just left it parked, so to speak, on GoDaddy servers, you could actually forward your domain to some domain you really control, maybe your personal homepage at harvard.edu. So in fact, I think this is what I do now with davidmalin.com, which I really have no intention of using, but it's shorter for me than typing www.eecs.harvard.edu slash tilde malin. So I, in GoDaddy's interface, actually told GoDaddy to forward this domain, davidmalin.com, to that whole URL I just rattled off. Well, how is GoDaddy doing that? Well, assuming they're running Apache, they just did something very similar in spirit to this, where they are just redirecting, either with rewrite rules or some other Apache tricks, redirection to some standard D URL that I myself provided. So this is telling Google and search engines in particular, this is a permanent redirection. Stop asking us the same question over and over again. Update your own databases if you're so inclined. Similarly for a browser, but it's more for search engine purposes. And the L just means this is the last relevant uh, rewrite line for this particular sequence of steps. In other words, you can have multiple things in a file, each of which looks a little different. And the L just makes sure it's like the break statement. It's like break in a switch statement in a typical programming language. OK? So any questions on this? Yeah? Ah, uh, good question. So is the web server itself, is Apache restarted when we make any, when you make any of these changes to HD access files? No, only when we change the master file would we need to restart the server to load the master config. But the nice thing about HD access files and the downside potentially is that they are parsed and evaluated every time someone requests content from your public HTML or subdirectory tree. So in theory, there's maybe a performance hit there, but certainly for development purposes, it just means your changes take effect right away. So for more such tricks, I mean, frankly, Googling Apache rewrite or Apache rewrite module will give you um, some nice tricks and instruction because, frankly, the documentation exists. But uh, Apache, the Apache Foundation tends to err on the side of succinctness as opposed to hold your hand. Here's how you solve a very common problem. So for those things, Google is your friend. And frankly, this is how I myself picked up a lot of such tricks, I'm just figuring it uh, um, asking someone else who's already solved this problem before. So know that there are many other variables that you can plug in there. There are neat tricks you can do if you want to force users to go over HTTPS. And this is a compelling reason. If you want to not expect that your users remember to type HTTPS colon, which is kind of unreasonable, you want them to type any URL that's appropriate, but then get redirected to HTTPS. Case in point, our own panel.cs75. Net. Notice how you've again been redirected to an SSL connection as well as had that port uh, appended to it. Well, how are we doing that? Well, this time, and I suppose we could have done this with a rewrite, but I decided that the quicker way, the night I set this up, was simply to do the following. If I go ahead and become the CS75 account and go into our public HTML directory and go into panel, Notice that I whipped up this very, here's your first PHP program, actually. What a perfect segue. So here is my first dynamic website. Uh, it's a little hard to read in red, but this file, index.php, which lives at panel.cs75.net, its sole purpose in life is to do, I guess highlighting it just made it more red, um, is to do what? Take a guess. 
It's a redirect. So you'll see this a lot, and we'll use this even in applications to redirect users from one page to another in dynamic websites. What this line of code is doing, as we'll begin to tease apart tonight and next week, is telling the web server, send the following HTTP header. That header begins with location colon, and that should look familiar already, because we saw that when sniffing the traffic in Firefox. Send anyone who visits this page, panel.cs75.net, to that URL. And we just did this as a convenience. But we could have done this with an HT access file as well. But now that I see what a perfect segue it is, I'm glad I did it this way. But wouldn't you get a 200 and therefore the browser would just show you a blank page? Why does this cause the browser to know Ah, good question. So wouldn't the web server be returning a 200 response, as in this was successful? Not if you are spitting out, overriding that header with a directive like this. So what this is saying, actually, it's a good question. Let's actually sniff the traffic and see what's done here. Let me go ahead and flush this log here. And I'm just going to go to the generic panel.75.net in Firefox, hit Enter. I'm going to go over here now to the top request. And this is indeed what I typed in up top. And it looks like the return was, in fact, this um, 301. So what the server was doing for me upon seeing the, uh, oh, oh, there's, uh, I'm slightly lying. We did this in another way. Let me scroll down a little further. Move temporary. OK. So never mind the man behind the curtain there. It turns out that there's a couple layers of redirection panel.cs75.net is unbeknownst to you, although now quite known to you, is redirecting you to cs75.net slash panel, which is just a subdirectory that I created in the course account's public HTML directory. And then there lives that index.php file that I mentioned. And that PHP file we saw is spitting out the following location line. And it because the web server Apache, because it's Apache, as we'll see tonight, that's executing these PHP files, realize you're spitting out a location line. It's inferring that this is actually a relocation. It's not a success outright, but rather it's just going to return these headers. And those of you familiar now with your Linux command lines, even though you've seen me just CDing into public HTML, this little at sign that we're seeing here actually means that public HTML in my account is what? So this is what's called a symbolic link, a uh, shortcut in Windows speak. Um, what this really means, if I type ls-l for long display, what public HTML is, is it's not a true folder per se, but rather it's a link, it's a shortcut to the current work directories, domains, subdirectory, or rather, is that right? Yep, followed by cs 75 something. Well, what does that mean? We'll notice that there's actually this other directory in the course account for instance. And if I go back and become Malin and go to my own home directory, notice that I have Mailder, which is where Malin at MailinRouge.com's email goes and whatnot. There's an IMAP directory, similar, and domains. Well, it turns out that in domains is really where my domains, plural, potentially are stored. Turns out, by default, I only have one domain, just as you for this course only have one domain. But the nice thing about direct admin and things like cPanel and Plesk is that they allow one user to host multiple domains out of his or her own account. So by default, it simply has symbolically linked public HTML to domains, Malin Rouge, and in there is the real public HTML directory, so to speak. So when we looked at Apache's configuration, notice that it wasn't just slash home, slash mailin, slash public HTML. It was this longer path. But that's because there's this layer of uh, indirection, so to speak, so that you can actually host multiple domains in an account like this. In fact, very similarly, can you potentially host subdomains for this course, which you might do for upcoming projects? So any questions on Apache or the like? Yeah. Ah, good question. Let me defer that question for just a bit. The question was, was the PHP file executable or just readable? It was only readable for reasons I'll come back to. Yeah? If we want to be um, creating subdomain with, with a different document root, mm -hmm. do we need to have access to the HTTPD conf file, or will the panel do that behind the scenes? You do not. The panel is wonderfully flexible in that if I log back in again, and I, the goal, to repeat the question, is to create subdomains, there are a couple of ways to do this, at least one of which will work very easily for you, which is if you go to subdomain management, I believe, very easily can I add a foo subdomain to mailinrouge.com. And I believe the way direct admin implements this is by creating a subdirectory 
in either your, in your public HTML directory, which isn't ideal, but there's another way that creates a separate directory altogether in this domains directory. So I encourage you to poke around, but you pretty much have autonomy. Um, and even though by default I'll say we've only enabled student accounts to host one domain with the course, if you're particularly adventurous and you would like to experiment with another domain or two, that should be fine. Just email us and we can tweak the settings so that you can do precisely that. Other questions? Okay, so before we'll, we come to the matter of permissions, which we very much will be, just to recap, mod rewrite is the feature that you can enable with Apache. Uh, it's already configured on the courses machine, but if you'd like to read more about these kinds of tricks over the course of the semester, this is the place to start officially. Google is the place to start unofficially. We talked about bind, which again is just the a very common name server that tends to run on Linux boxes, and we looked at one of its configuration files. Um, so now a word on sections. So this first week of the course with Project Zero, probably not terribly intense for many of you with programming experience or HTML experience. With Project One to be distributed next week, we'll begin building actual dynamic websites. And increasingly, we expect will sections prove advantageous to those of you who are able to locally. So we're still going to call this a preliminary schedule. You have a piece of paper in front of you tonight and during our break we'll ask that you get, provide your preferences on that sheet and we'll then reply later this week via email as to which section and thus teaching fellow to which you've been assigned but know that we might, um, we're going to try to base the scheduling and the assignment of sections both on, both on students level of savvy and comfort with the material as well as based on your um, availability during the week. So we've very consciously cho uh, made available sections like, uh, let's say, what's today? Monday. So right before lecture, for those of you who would rather only commute to Cambridge just once during the week. Saturdays, for those of you who can barely get away during the week as it is and thus would rather a uh, weekend section. Know also if you can't attend physically or you're not even here today and are tuning in via uh, distance education, the virtual classroom um, is going to be led by teaching fellow Chris Power, who, uh, rather apropos perhaps, isn't even in Cambridge himself. He lives in Philadelphia and will thus be leading our online section via this software called Illuminate, a handout for which we distributed last week. And this virtual classroom, we won't use it for video and probably not even audio, but rather for chat sessions. And Chris will have the ability both to share control of his screen and provide on-screen demos and slides and whatnot. And I think we'll adapt over the course of the semester based on um, kinds of questions are coming up and what kind of interest we have from students. So anyone can tune into this one. And then we have a couple of others, one of whose location is to be announced. But notice that one section on an experimental basis on Thursdays, uh, as we began this past week, will have a live video feed. So if you simply can't make it to campus and you don't mind sacrificing that ability to raise your hand in person, um, you'll be able to tune in at least live. And what we're going to do also as an experiment, if I'm not throwing too much at you, too quickly is we're going to have Dan Armandaris physically teaching this section, uh, fed uh, live onto the internet, and then we'll also have one of the teaching fellows in the virtual classroom, so to speak, uh, so that students watching Dan's section live can ask questions by typing in the virtual classroom where the other teaching fellow will either field them himself uh, or by relaying it verbally to Dan in this class. So we'll see how well that works matter of um, trying to adapt to as many learning styles as possible. Uh, also administratively, office hours we hope will become increasingly useful over time so that you have an opportunity to sit down with a teaching fellow by your side or at least knowing that there's a teaching fellow uh, potentially by your side while working on projects. We'll play that schedule by ear but either we'll have these in the 53 Church Street lab or in the Harvard Science Center. Uh, these photographs make both look like wonderful places to visit so you'll the stress will just melt away if you visit either of these for assistance and know that per last week's handout we'll have virtual office hours as well for one-on-one -on -one assistance. So in short, stay tuned to the course's website. Let's go ahead and take a five-minute break here. And if you could spend one of those five minutes filling out that form and passing it to the nearest aisle, that would be great. All right, we are back. And in what is perhaps the best example of uh, what you get out of this class, perhaps, allow me to pull up harvard.edu again. And uh, in just a moment, as soon as my browser does, in fact, respond, allow me to stall a little longer. Ah, it works now. If we could, to the folks who are clearly sitting in this room fixing things. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 
I myself have taken away that I should look at the uh, enrollment list before giving demonstrations in class, though, perhaps, since we have some folks on staff here taking this class. So all the better, though, that it's, it's all resolved now. So are you, yes? So, uh-huh. Sure. Good question. So just to recap, what is the order of operations here? So I type in, for instance, mailinrouge.com at my browser on my laptop here and hit enter. That HTTP request goes across the wire to a specific IP address, and that host colon line is sent, presumably, by the browser in that request so that the server now, say cs75.net, realizes, OK, this is destined for me because it's my IP address. Uh, it's on port 80. Now let me look at all of the virtual hosts that have been defined in my HTTP.conf file, uh, as well as all the separate files that direct admin happened to create for students in this course that are linked effectively to that master file. Ah, here's one matching mailinrouge.com. Here's the directory root. It's slash home, slash mailin, and so forth. Ah, wait, in this public HTML directory is a .htaccess file. Let me parse that. Oh, this htaccess file is telling me to redirect to www.mailinrouge.com. Let me just quit now and reply to this request with that uh, HTTP 302, 301 message. My browser says, ah, I found the right server, but I've been told to look elsewhere. That whole process repeats, this time ending up in the same directory that I own. The HTTP ac HT access file doesn't do anything this time, because I'm now at www.mailinrouge.com. And so Apache looks in public HTML, says, ah, there's index.html. It does an F read, spits out the bytes across the wire, closes the connection, and I see my home page on the laptop there. Okay, and if that was too fast, happy to chat about it again afterward. But that's the basic HT, uh, and that's the long version of a typical HTTP resp request response because of that layer of redirection. So how do you begin doing this kind of stuff and more in this course? So as I said last week, you all will ha have accounts or will have accounts on cs75.net where ultimately things do need to work properly, be submitted properly, and so forth. But you certainly have the ability and are welcome to develop code for this course on your own machines. That in and of itself is perhaps a valuable lesson um, and a valuable takeaway. So there are many different ways to do this. Perhaps the most tedious is to tease apart the L, A, M, and P in LAMP and go download a Linux distribution and install it on an x86 box that you own. And then go download the freely available Apache web server, the tarball or the zip file, and compile that, may then install it. And then you can do the same for MySQL. And then you can do the same with PHP or dot, 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 you can just download this thing. So XAMP is a wonderful free product, so to speak, put together by some wonderful people who have taken the time to make easy the process of installing most everything you'll be using in this course for its projects and its final project. XAMP is the name of this distribution. And all they've done is to glom together some other freely available products, but they've wrapped it in a nice installer. They've put a nice little GUI front end on it so that you can configure things a bit more easily. And it, frankly, is a godsend if you want to just get up and running quickly. Not necessarily in a production environment, but in a development environment where you don't really have to worry so much about performance and security, all of which would sort of uh, warrant more attention to detail and configuration files. But I, just before class, for instance, downloaded the installer for XAMPP from the course website's software page. I then followed the link, which one of our teaching fellows, Cato, has been kind enough to put together. If you go to Resources under XAMPP, you'll see this document, How to Install XAMPP, and you have this wonderful one-page how-to that just tells you, thanks to Cato, step-by-step, step, how to put this thing on your machine. What will you have on your machine in the end? Well, first and foremost, you will have Apache. You'll have your own web server running on your own computer. Not so useful so, for mom to come and visit your projects in the course, but wonderfully useful for you to develop them. What you will do if you decide to develop stuff on your own machine is not visit http colon slash slash mailinrouge.com or your own domain name. You'll just visit http colon slash slash localhost, which on most any system today, Mac, Windows, uh, Linux, will resolve to the local machine, that is your machine, or 
by convention, so will 127.0.0.1. So yeah, there's typically a configuration on your own Windows, Mac OS, or Linux box that resolves one to the other. So what does that mean? Well, that means you'll be running a web server on your own computer. And in that web server will be support for MySQL, as well as PHP, and even some other stuff, Perl. So the XAMP here, the X apparently denotes um, a variable, a placeholder for any of these several operating systems. They even have support for Solaris. And then the AMP is Apache, MySQL, PHP. The other P is Perl, which I'll wave my hands at and fade out since we're not going to focus so much on it in this course. Um, and it also has a number of tools. PHP MyAdmin, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, is a wonderful GUI with which to manage MySQL databases rather than using command line instructions. So that, too, gets rolled into it as well. It's a godsend, frankly. If you care about just getting real work done and not dealing with futzing around on your computer so much, but instead want to just get things working. So once you have that on your box, you can go ahead and work on most any of the course's projects. And then once you're happy with how things are working and you want to test it on the server, then can you upload it via SFTP or the panel.cs75.net and make sure that it's working there as well. And so long as you use relative pads and you don't hard code things like C colon backslash into your code, things should, in theory, work. So do take a look at that as well. And in sections over the next week or two, we can certainly walk you through an installation of this, or better yet, bring your laptops if you'd like to section if you're having any uh, troubleshooting issues at all. So we concluded last week with a quick look at forms, which if unfamiliar with HTTP, uh, HTML before last week, was all about implementing support for user input in a web page. These radio buttons and text boxes and select menus and big text areas, password prompts, and more. And so these were some basic snippets. And I appended one this week, text areas, which I didn't have last week, which pretty much um, constitute all of the typical user input mechanisms today. So we said that a classic example of this is right on Google's homepage. So it, websites today don't get much simpler, quite ironically, than Google. Uh, you have a text field, which is implemented, if you've never looked, with the very first of these things, input name equals something, type equals text. You then have a button, which is implemented either with type equals button, or type equals submit, and then you have another button with another label altogether. And as a funny aside, or a fascinating aside, I don't know if any of you saw this article a couple weeks ago maybe, where someone um, acknowledged in writing that this little button here, based on just the billions of dollars in cash that Google makes these days, actually costs them something on the order of millions of dollars. Because even if 0.01% of you actually use this I'm feeling lucky button, we'll multiply that by the millions of hits that Google gets every hour or every day. And you have some non-trivial number of users who are never seeing what? Ads. Um, and for uh, do no evil reasons, and I think similar philosophical reasons, they've kept it there for long. Though, out of curiosity, how many of you use the I'm feeling lucky button? OK, so there, there's the hidden cost to Google there. So in any case, let's go ahead and implement Google. Right? I implemented CNN last week. Let's go ahead and implement Google this week. So what's this going to take? Well, we can certainly start off by learning from Google. And I can go to Google.com. I can right click the page and I can view source. And you should realize that this is very much a useful um, instruct, uh, instructional technique as you sort of figure out how you can implement features similar to other websites. You know, sh uh, I would stop short of just outright ripping off code, but rather look to it for just explanations. So how did they do this? How did they position something here? How did they structure their form? Because this is a wonderful way to learn. Now you'll notice that this stuff isn't very well formatted. There's really not so much white space here. Any guesses as to why, most likely? It's cheaper, right? You serve up billions of pages a day. You don't want to be sending backslash n's and white spaces and backslash r's unnecessarily. It's just costing you bytes. And those bytes add up over a while, I'm assuming. So you might have to clean this up with a text editor or some other tool. But nested in there, somewhere, if I search for open bracket form, is this thing here. And it looks like. The means by which Google is implementing their form is with open bracket form action. So if you've never used forms before, when you declare a form on a web page, you need to tell it where to submit the data. When the user hits Enter or clicks a button, where should that HTTP request get sent? Well, in this case, it's going to be sent to slash search. 
There's, and then there's this, uh, this other variable there called name equals f for reasons that will come to probably come JavaScript time. Then Google has decided to use a table to lay out the fairly simple form that's there. But if I scroll, if I search further for open bracket input, what we'll see is okay. So here is a hidden field. And I won't waste time for now trying to infer what that hidden field is doing, but know that hidden fields, and we will likely use these over the course of the semester, are a way of passing data from browser to server without the user having to type that field in. It's sort of a useful trick if used with security in mind to pass data from page to page without the user outright seeing it. Let's go a little further. It looks like there's this other input here in the top of my window that says uh, an input the type of which is actually not specified, the value of which is not specified, but the name of which is, so Q. So it turns out that Q, I'm going to guess, means query. This is probably the means by which Google is implementing their big text field that I can type whatever search query it is I'm interested in. Let's fast forward a little bit further and search for I'm feeling, OK, here's this thing. So now there's this other thing called input, name equals button I. Type equals submit, value equals I'm feeling lucky. And so this is how Google has implemented that second submit button. And we'll tease apart over time you know, what it means to give things names and these different types and these different values. But for today, there's really not all that much to Google. right? It's rather tragic that none of us thought of this. right? So there's not that much driving this site. Now let's take a look with our little plugin exactly what goes across the wire when I do search for something. So if I go ahead and search for uh, hard drives and hit enter. What I get back obviously is some, uh, some ads and re um, hits, but let's look at the request that went across the wire. So when I hit enter, it's really small there. Let me see if I can copy this and paste it into a bigger font. Copy. Let's see if I can put it in here. Okay. It's perhaps the only good use for a word pad on a PC. So here we have this string here. So this is what my browser apparently just sent to the web server. And that appears to have been automatically generated by the action of the user hitting Enter or clicking the Submit button. So it looks like the, um, the action of that form was, again, what? Remind me? So it was slash search. So that's why appended to the current domain name, which was www.google.com, is slash search. And now there's this question mark, which actually didn't appear anywhere in that form, the means by which forms relay input variables to a web server, that is user input, is to append to the URL in question a question mark, and then append to that a sequence of uh, name equals value pairs. If you want to have another one, you would have name 2 equals value 2, and another one, name 3 equals value 3. Now what do I mean by this? Well, Google only really has one major field, and it was called Q for query. But you can imagine most any page that has name, email address, uh, password, and the like. Well, each of those form fields, those open bracket input tags, have names or should have names. And so what the browser does is it figures out what are all the input types within this form, and then it assembles them in this format. The name of that field equals whatever the user typed in. Ampersand, the name of the other field, equals whatever the user typed in as its value. If the user typed in nothing, well, if the user typed in nothing for the second field, that's what would probably go across the wire. And it's up to the server or your code, your PHP code, to sort of deal with that somehow. But just to come back to this point here, what went across the wire in the case of Google? Question mark, which means here comes the name value pairs. Uh, HL or H1 equals EN, so some kind of language encoding, presumably English, since I was on the US site. Ampersand Q equals hard drives. So there's a plus there. Take a guess what that's denoting. Space. So there's a way of encoding things in URLs, because it's not such good practice to use true spaces in URLs and even in directory or file names. It's just not good practice, typically. But when you do need to encode spaces, plus is often used. You'll also see in other context uh, percent 20, which we'll come back to over time. And then it looks like button G. So that's apparently the name of the button that was effectively submitted, the search button, as opposed to the lucky button. And we see its label there. More information than needs to go across the wire, but clearly the labels of buttons do seem to go across the wire.
So can I use this knowledge to now implement my own Google, if you will? All right, well, last week in Malin Rouge, I had a very simple web page. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this whole thing. And I'm going to go ahead and create a file called google.html in Malin, uh, yep, in Malin Rouge's site, google.html. I'm going to paste in that content there. And just to be clear, I'm going to say uh, this shall be Google. OK, and I'll put this up here, my Google. OK, now I'm just going to take a moment and do ls-l. And notice that this file, google.html, actually has these permissions. And we'll come back to either tonight or next week exactly what these things are denoting and why they should differ for HTML files versus PHP files. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and actually make that not writable, so that uh, just for practice sake. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead to mailinrouge.com. And assuming I didn't mess up uh, my HT access file earlier, which I did, since we're now going back to <laughs> CNN. But Hopefully, the redirection makes all the more sense. Let me quickly fix this. I'm going to go ahead and just turn this stuff off by commenting it out for now. Right? So now the user will stay there. I'm going to skip all that dub 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 standardization and try again. So google.html. OK, Malin Rude. Google.html. No rewrite is happening. All right. I think I did. Yeah, so we're going to change browsers for a second. <laughs> OK, there we go. Stupid, stupid caching issues that I'll wave my hands at for now. So this is not very legible. Let me go ahead and open this up. And let's change BG color to that. And even that, I'm being a little lazy. I could do that with CSS. But here it is. Here shall be Google. All right, so now how do I implement Google? Well, I need a form. So I'm going to go ahead and go in here. Um, and again, with complete disregard today for aesthetics, I'm just going to make some space here. And I'm going to define a form. Now, the action of this form needs to be where this form is going to get submitted. Now, if I just did this, what's the problem? Exactly. It's going to get submitted to the same server, which is not quite what I want, unless I also want to go implement the actual Google search capability. Um, let me go ahead and actually, this is a little dark. Uh, that didn't seem to affect us. Let's go to. Yeah, I'll do this the quick way. Let's just turn it off for now. OK, all white. So no more syntax highlighting, but hopefully more readable. So I don't want just slash search. Where do I want to submit this to? OK, so actually, probably google.com. Right, I'm going to borrow some of their code if I can. OK, and now I need to actually specify a method, which I glossed over earlier. So the different methods we talked about thus far are either get, or there's this other common one, post. And there's a few others, but these are the two most common. So I'm going to say get, just so I can perfectly mimic Google. And we'll see what the difference is in a moment. I'm going to close this form proactively so I have nice, well-formed XHTML. And now in here, I'm going to have an input type equals text. The name of this thing is, needs to be what, again? Q. Q, all right. And the value I'm going to not even specify. I'm going to close this as an empty element. And then I'm going to just put some space under there. And then I'm going to have an input type equals uh, submit. And then I'm going to have a value of uh, David's Google search and close that out. All right, I'm going to skip the lucky button for now. I'm going to save this, reload my page. And all right, so I'm on my way to making the next Google. So I have a text field now. I think I got the action field right. Let's go ahead and search for hard, hard drives, enter. Uh, voila. Now you've been seeing how to build dynamic websites like CNN, uh, dynamic websites like Google, and <laughs> here we go. So what actually happened across the wire? Well, let's again go back to our friend, this, this, um, this Firefox plugin, Live HTTP headers. Let me clear that. Let me go ahead and type in hard drives again, David's Google search. And what went across the wire? Well, this time we had, what happened here? That's not what I wanted. Let's try that again. Oh, can't do it in IE and sniff with Firefox. So let's open Firefox, live HTTP headers. Hopefully the caching is gone. No. OK, watch this little hack. Shift. All right. Oh, but I need to simultaneously type it and hold Shift. OK, wait. Clear private data. Clear everything. 
You will remember this day when you yourself are doing this on your own problem set and trying to fix something. I suspect, mailandrouge.com, whew, there we go, clear the cache. Okay, today's takeaway, if you get nothing else out of this, don't email us before clearing your cache when trying to diagnose some problem. All right, so now hard drive, Google search. All right, here's all of the stuff. There's a lot, because there's a lot of, there's some JavaScript on this page typically, and there's some content, so here we go. So I made that request of Google in this first line, which is exactly as we expected. I skipped the English encoding thing. It doesn't appear their server cares so much. This was the get request. It's a little small, but what my web page and thus my browser generated was quite simply that in the HTTP request. It appears to have sent a host of www.google.com. And then the response came back as an HTTP 200 response, which presumably was all of that content. So that's pretty much it for an HTML form. There are other features to these things, certainly, that we'll, we ourselves will use over time. But at the basics, it involves a form element, telling it where to submit by way of the action line. There's that thing called a method, which we'll come back to in a second. And then you need the inputs. And it's ultimately, in this course, going to be up to us to start writing the PHP code that then takes that user input and does something with it, much like Google did with some responses here. So what is an HTTP POST request all about as opposed to a GET request? Yeah? Excellent. So recall that it has to do with where, how the data is transmitted from browser to server. In the case of get, to uh, reiterate, it is passed via the URL itself. In the case of post, it's not. So what do we mean by that? Well, in fact, if I go back to the real Google and then type in uh, hard drives, notice that I'm at www.google.com right now. But if I hit Enter, where do I end up? Well, I end up at precisely the URL that I copied and pasted into WordPad here a moment ago. So it appears that the form input has been very naively, trivially relayed to the web server just by creating a much longer URL. But this is certainly not the case with many websites, right? When you upload a, a photo to Flickr, you don't see the photo appearing in the URL, even though it too is going from browser to server. When you log into MySpace or Facebook, if you're among those users, you don't typically see your password going in the URL that that suddenly appears when you hit enter. I mean, what was the obvious explanation for that? Right, not so secure, right? Almost every browser out there caches these things. And so if you were passing username equals mail-in, ampersand password equals 1234, don't try that, it will simply be obvious to anyone who sits down at that browser afterwards. So for various reasons, one of which is security, another of which is for um, uh, uh, for size reasons, can you use method equals post? Um, know that in XHTML, these values should be lowercase in order to be valid, even though we typically write them in other contexts as capitals. But notice if I change now my own version of Google, because I can't change theirs, and I go back to mailandrouge.com Google HTML, and I'll make all this code available, by the way, on the course's lectures page after tonight, if you'd like to look at it. Uh, and I type in now, after reloading, hard drives, enter, notice that there's actually an error, which is actually atypical of, hmm, it's not uncommon, but not implemented. What is not implemented, apparently? Post. Post. So it looks like, for whatever reasons, Google just doesn't support this post method. And I say that it's, that, it's atypical of a, t of a typical web server, which I guess is getting me off the hook there. But that is to say most web servers, certainly Apache out of the box, does allow you to submit data via get or post. And for now, we'll come back to this in just a bit. But for now, know that post does not transmit its data via the URL. Rather, it sends it how? Anyone know? So it's sort of in the headers, in the body, though, of the HTTP request. And in fact, the best way we can do this, actually, we'll come back to this as soon as we implement our first version of PH, uh, our first real PHP file. And we'll see exactly how the data is getting submitted via post. Yeah. It's a good question. So why would you not want to use why would you not want to just use post all of the time? A couple of reasons, one of which is that by changing the URL as Google does, it makes it really easy for me to email search results to friends 
So for, and you can imagine other contexts as well where it's really annoying if you visit some site that maybe you've searched for the latest hard drive prices on Newegg.com and if they're using sessions or they're using post data, you can't copy that state by way of the URL. Another reason is if you've ever visited a website and then hit reload, you get that message saying if you hit OK, this data will be resubmitted to the website, which is good, it has its purposes, but that can confuse users, it's annoying, so you avoid that by using get sometimes. So it really depends. But the most compelling reason perhaps is it's useful to remember state. So you can copy and thus bookmark URLs. So enter the world of PHP. We're done stealing the work of CNN and Google, and we're going to start solving problems ourselves. So here's this language known as PHP. So for years have folks been able to implement dynamic websites. So Perl, for instance, was commonly used and still used to make dynamic websites in the context of what's called CGI. Um, ASPs are Microsoft's answer, for instance, to um, or have been in the past, Microsoft's answer to the world of CGI. Uh, other languages you can use for website development. JSP. Oh, JSP, Cold Fusion, C. C. Yes, if you really want to re-implement the wheel in C or C++. <laughs> uh, servlets. There are many different Python, Ruby on Rails. You can implement dynamic websites using many different programming languages. And at the end of the day, the mo the means by which you should choose the language probably boil down to different reasons for different people. One, I tend to pick a language that I already know, because frankly that's pretty compelling. Two, sometimes certain languages are just better suited for problems at hand. So for Perl, for instance, is wonderful for doing a lot of regular expression matching when you want to actually parse out data. Um, fortunately, PHP sort of borrowed most of that module, so you can do the same in PHP. But newer languages like PHP and Ruby on Rails and um, JSPs, they still let you solve the same problems, but often much more easily because they were designed, or at least the frameworks that people use them in, were designed with website development in mind. Unlike, for instance, C, where I could absolutely implement, H um, I could absolutely implement um, a little uh, dynamic website myself in C, but I would end up having to parse all of that uh, name equals value pair, ampersand name equals value pair, myself, and in C that's not so much fun. I could do that in Perl as well, and I can do that in other languages, but frankly PHP, as well as some other recent languages, were designed with website development in mind, and it allows you to get up and running much more quickly. And I will defer to various online debates and resources as to maybe which language is higher performing in certain contexts, but undoubtedly PHP, coupled with MySQL and some of these other technologies we'll talk about in this course, are certainly commonly used and um, and compelling choices. So even Facebook, which gets a ridiculous number of hits um, to date, still uses PHP for a lot of its front end, though I think a lot of their back end stuff has been written at a lower level, presumably in C or C++ or something like that. But not an uncommon approach. So the nice thing too about PHP, frankly, is that it's really easy to teach it to yourself. The documentation is wonderful. As we'll see on PHP.net is sort of PHP's answer to Javadoc, which if you know Java, you've probably depended on Javadoc. And the PHP.net is, there say better because it's replete with many examples of usage. Uh, PHP, for better or for worse, is only weakly typed, which means you don't have to worry so much about typing as you would in, um, say, a language like C, C++, but it's rare that types are so uh, unlike the world of, say, Java and JSPs, where you actually worry a bit more about types. But again, a religious debate can arise there. So where do you begin teaching yourself something like PHP? Fortunately, you're in the right room, but also this will be an invaluable resource for you over the course of the semester. Uh, by no means will we bore you with a discussion of every function and library that's available to you via PHP, because frankly, it would be incredibly mind-numbing of a course if we did that. In fact, we'll tr focus rather on some of the basic principles, on some of the syntax early on, and some of the underlying um, constructs so that you can then bootstrap yourselves. If you want to figure out how to, uh, for instance, send an email in PHP, well, Google PHP mail, and you'll probably be led to this URL uh, with a more specific path to like the mail function. You'll see a couple of examples, and you'll be able to, you'll be on your way right away. But we're also going to be using in this course a module in Apache called SU PHP. Uh, this is for the following reason. Typically, at least before people started thinking about this, web servers would run under what username on a typical Linux box? So they'd run on as Apache, as uh, web apps, as, God forbid, root, 
uh, as nobody, as various different usernames, but there's a bunch of downsides to this. Because if I'm, for instance, username Malin, uh, working on a Linux box whose web server is running under the Apache username or the nobody username. And that web server's job in life is to take requests in, like we've discussed today, but at the end of the day, find my files and then present them on the internet. What does that suggest about what my own file's permissions need to be? It needs to be readable, obviously, by username Malin, but also by who else? So also by Apache, and typically the way you do that is to chmod things, so to speak, 644, so that you have read-write privileges and everybody else on the system has read privileges. And that might be fine, certainly if you run your own box, but very often our machines um, shared these days among multiple users, even commercial websites. It's probably not the best thing as you start implementing not HTML files, which obviously Anyone in the world should be able to read them by nature of the beast. But when you start actually contributing intellectual property to your websites and writing code, then probably you don't want other people looking at for reasons of security or reasons of um, you know, intellectual property. It's kind of nice to be able to have your files chmoded 600 for instance, so that only you can read and write them and no one else has access to those files. But you need, obviously, to let the web server be able to read and thus execute these files. And so this module, SUPHP, is actually installed automatically for us by direct admin, but you can also download it from that URL there and install it on existing web servers. In a nutshell, what it does is it tells Apache to execute files in Malin's public HTML directory as username Malin, and files in Dan's directory as username um, Dan and so forth for each of you, as opposed to our needing to make all of our files accessible by anyone. So this is useful not just for protecting yeah, secrets within them and also protecting um, uh, your own intellectual property, but think about any website that actually has to store data on the local file system. Suppose you were implementing Flickr or some website that allows users to upload photos. Well, even if you wrote a PHP file, if the web server is running as username Apache and your files are thus chmodded 644 so that Apache, and thus everyone else can read them, when Apache saves that file, or really when your PHP code saves that file, the photograph, to the local file system, who's going to own it? It's going to be owned by username Apache. Um, not by username Malin, for instance. And that just begins to create a whole slew of problems, among which are you don't have control over the files that your own software was creating because it wasn't being run by you. Worse yet, if I, for instance, am running some PHP code that has the ability to store files, for instance, in some directory, but some other user on the system, because their code gets executed under the same username, in theory, if they guess the location of my files, they could change my files, copy my files, delete my files. I mean, you just run into a whole bunch of problems when everybody is running their code under the same username. So this module, which again is, can be installed on other systems as well, um, quite e fairly easily allows each of your pieces of code to be uh, run as you which means the worst damage you can do, frankly, to the system is only to accidentally, say, delete all of your own files and not those of another student or of the course. And there are other reasons as well. Yeah? Good question. Um, is this relevant only to uh, servers running um, a lot of different users simultaneously, virtually? Definitely compelling, yes, in that context, but even in other systems as well. Even if you have a Linux box where the web server by default is running as Apache for various reasons because the configuration files are owned by Apache and so forth, odds are you probably don't want that same username and group to own other files as well necessarily. So just to have that, that layer of abstraction in between the two can be useful. So I think it's, but you can achieve it with other tasks in other ways as well. Yeah. Is it used widely? Uh, absolutely for shared hosting that offers PHP support. There's a couple of other uh, modules that can implement this same idea. Uh, I think SUPHP is pretty darn easy to get up and running, but if you Google things like uh, set UID and PHP, you'll see some other tricks and wrappers people have come up with to do this as well. 
So it's certainly good practice, and a few different solutions exist for it in PHP and in other contexts. All right, so what is this language known as PHP? So your unofficial homework for this week, and probably will be your official homework for next week, will be to read the manual. Okay, it's not terribly long, this part of the manual, but certainly if you've come into this course with a background in some other language, it's quite easy to pick up the basic syntax of PHP just by reading the few links that are at that particular URL. You'll find that PHP is very similar to Java, C, C++, C Sharp, any of these fairly modern procedural languages. Um, the syntax is largely borrowed from them. Um, with a few other tricks thrown in as well. You'll see that the title of this slide is open bracket question mark PHP. What we'll see, and you glimpsed maybe earlier in my index.php file, is that PHP ultimately is an interpreted language, although that can, can be made into a bit of a white lie. So an interpreted language, we recall, is typically one that's not compiled. So when I write a program in PHP, and it's meant to be served on the web, it's just a text file. And I just happen to create it dot, uh, file name dot PHP. And then the web server knows, because of how we've configured Apache with all those configuration files, to execute any files ending in dot PHP. But a PHP file is just text. The way by which Apache knows to execute something as, PH, as PHP, as opposed to assuming it's just HTML, is as follows. If I have a file called index.php, anything in between open bracket question mark PHP, as in this font here, and I'll fix our colors for next week, open bracket question mark PHP in the top left hand corner here, that's telling Apache execute as PHP code anything between these two brackets. And actually it gets a little annoying or ugly to constantly type uh, open bracket question mark PHP. So what we have enabled on our server, which is not uncommon, is the ability just to do open bracket question mark. And think of this, ASPs have something similar, JSPs have something similar. Um, it's better practice to put the PHP there for various reasons, but you tend not to see people doing it so much. Yes, so this is why we this is why all of your pages thus far have been tentatively valid because in an XML document, which XHTML is, you should typically put an XML declaration at the very top of the file which tells it what version um, or what version of XML the file contains and that begins with open bracket question mark. The problem is when you're putting that that uh, uh, declaration in PHP files, it confuses the interpreter. So the simplest fix for courses purposes is just say, skip it. Let everything be tentatively valid. Um, but that's more about XML than it is about PHP per se. This is how you'll, I typically write things, though realize that both approaches are possible. So actually, before we forge ahead too far, let me go ahead and do this. Let me go ahead and change um, index.html from Malin Rouge, because recall from last week, Malin Rouge looks like this. And that's because the file looks like this. But you know what? I'm going to make my first dynamic website by writing this website not in XHTML per se, but in PHP. Here we go. MV uh, index.html index.php. OK, I'm going to go back here. My first dynamic website. I've now rewritten this website not in HTML, but in PHP. And this is what I mean by. PHP being very intertwined with the development of websites. What, a P, what PHP, and really Apache, which has been configured to support PHP, is doing is it will interpret anything that's not between open bracket question mark, question mark close bracket, as just raw data that should just be spit back out to the browser. And because that's all I have here, that's exactly what gets spit out to the browser still. Nothing has actually changed. But if I wanted to do something a little more interesting, I might do the following. And I'll just pick, whip up a really silly example here. But I'm going to go ahead here and add open bracket question mark. And now I'm going to guess at the syntax, just to emphasize how this is very C or Java-like. For dollar sign $i gets 0, uh, i is less than, let's say, 10, dollar sign $i++. Plus plus. Needless to say, variables in PHP have uh, dollar signs prefixing them. What I'm going to do here now, and I'm actually going to make this a little neater, I'm going to now indent this, and I'm actually going to call the print function, or the printf function. I'm going to use single quotes so that I don't have to worry about the double quotes that are inside that. And now down here, I'm going to say question mark 
close bracket. So you can kind of infer, if you know most any function, uh, procedural programming language, that this is just going to loop 10 times and print out that thing 10 times. Now the effect is going to be pretty nasty. And in fact, just to make it a little better, I'm going to put a line break after each image. I'm going to save it. And assuming I made no syntactic errors, if I reload this page, it just got a lot longer. <laughs> okay, So now this is my first dynamic website. All right, I'm not taking user input yet, but let's look at the source. You can imagine what just happened. It's actually a little messy. Let me clean it up in PHP. Let me go ahead and it turns out there's a concatenation operator, which is dot. Uh, Java, it's plus. JavaScript, it's plus. In PHP, it's dot. Uh, if I want to go ahead and append a new line character, I'm going to put it in double quotes so that it is actually interpreted as such, an escaped character. Now I'm going to reload. Didn't change the aesthetics of the page. Did change the aesthetics of the source. Let me copy and paste this into Notepad where I have a bigger font. And notice what I've spit out. It's just 10 of those things. OK, so even if you're doing something quick and dirty and stupid, clearly there's, it's pretty darn easy to start whipping up pages. But we're going to go far beyond this. But there we have my first PHP page. And let me make one other note. There's this other way you can install support for PHP into a web server. We've installed it as a PHP module which means if I had really done this from scratch, I'd have downloaded and installed Apache, maybe after compiling it. I'd have downloaded and compiled um, PHP. I'd put it in some, special, uh, some specific directory on my Linux box. Then I'd have gone into Apache's httpd.conf file and uncommented probably a few default lines that then inform Apache where it can find the PHP binaries. And then after restarting my web server, would, PH, would Apache no, because I've taught it to do so by way of that config file to interpret any file ending in .php as a PHP file. But that's convention. You could make it interpret a .foo file as PHP. It all has to do with the config. Or there's this other approach. In fact, on FAS, on FAS's systems, if we were actually using them, you could actually run PHPs on FAS's boxes, if you're familiar with the setup, but not as an Apache module, but rather in CGI mode. So those of you with a background in Perl and the like, even C, if you did that, used C with, P with um, CGI. The other way you can install PHP, which is sometimes done by sysadmins for security reasons, because it's sort of the easier way to force users to run programs under their own usernames without having to install special stuff like SUPHP, is you would have to put at the top of every file something like this. Um, shebang user local bin PHP. In other words, you write the PHP file as though it were a shell script. And you tell the web server what binary to use to interpret the following file. This is fine. For all intents and purposes, it works fine. It's a pain, though, if you ever want to download third-party software, like a bulletin board software, or some other library that someone else has written. Because often, if you download some wonderfully useful tools off the internet, freely available, and they come with dozens of PHP files, you are going to have to whip out Emacs and manually add that to the top of every file. Or you're going to have to write a script yourself to go add it there. CGI mode is a pain if you actually want to, if you're going to be running your own server. So just tuck that away. And I say that having had to write such scripts myself to sort of get PHP working on other systems that it's not already installed. With XAMPP, nicely enough, it will be installed as an Apache module, which means it will just work out of the box for you. All right, so variables. Boring to read this. There's the definition of a variable as to what it can start with. It probably starts with the kinds of characters you would assume. <coughs> Done with variables. All right, so what about types in PHP? Today, the, the remaining 10 minutes of tonight's class is really about some of the basic syntax of PHP um, and laying the groundwork for actually building some useful programs next week and beyond, especially as we then introduce in a couple of weeks databases. So technically, PHP does have different types. It's weakly typed in the sense that you get a lot of implicit conversion among different types to the extent that you, the programmer, don't often have to think about or worry about type so much, for better or for worse. So Booleans, integers, floats, and strings are the, the truly primitive types in the language. There's also the um, a built-in notion of an array, and also objects. With PHP 5 came support for object-oriented programming in PHP, which is becoming increasingly uh, common in packages you might incorporate from the web and the like. And then there's these 
Um, other uh, types, so to speak, resource and null, which you'll see um, appear throughout the documentation. And then these other ones, which aren't types, but are this hand wavy thing saying P this function might return a bunch of different things. Mixed number callback. A number means might return a float or an integer. Mixed means it can return a bunch of stuff. So this is the funny thing with PHP. Unlike most programming languages with which you're familiar, a function can return different types. You don't declare the return type of a function, you just return something of a specified type. So this creates weird situations, as we'll see over time, whereby a function might return an array, but whereas in most languages, if it doesn't return an array, it would probably return what's the opposite of an array being returned, or you know, the equivalent like a null reference or a null pointer, right? If you're not returning an actual array, you're just returning nothing. Well, commonly in PHP, does the function actually return a Boolean false, OK, by convention and for other reasons. So you'll see this funny thing in the literature, which shouldn't cause you much consternation, because it's quite, um, you get accustomed to it. But just as you've seen in Java 101, the assignment operator, and you've seen the equality operator, there is now the equals 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 operator. Um, <laughs> And hopefully it will stop there. But as you'll see, and this is not terribly common, but I bring it up now because it's a funny, neat feature of PHP. This checks A and B not only for values, but also for equivalent types. So what do I mean by implicit conversion? Well, in many languages, in a lot of common, uh, a lot of popular languages today, uh, if you are comparing a null value against an integer, the null will be implicitly converted, likely to a uh, a zero, right? And then they'll be compared. But with PHP, sometimes you want to check not only the values, but also the types. You might see this throughout some of the examples. And I bring it up now only because that's probably one of the first questions that comes up from someone who hasn't seen the language before. That's all it's doing, checking the values as well as the types. If you're a little scared by this idea of typing and lack of typing, implicit conversion, it's not, uh, this is not meant to overemphasize it, but to introduce some basics. So references. This is a wonderful place to start as well for a discussion of what a reference is. We'll probably discuss this by way of example rather than doing a tutorial on references. But PHP does support references so that you're not passing things always by value or copy per se. Uh, you're passing things in the sense of a Java reference or kind of sort of a C or C++ pointer. So you'll see something like this discussed in the literature and we'll have examples of such over time. Um, super globals. And now we start immediately to get to some of the fundamental language features that are clearly related to website development. So here too is what I mean by PHP being very intertwined with web development. Out of the box you get, assuming PHP is running on a web server and not just at the command line, you get access to what are called super globals. So we'll see over time that PHP does support global variables, albeit in kind of an annoying way as we'll see. And it also supports super globals, which are actually globals in the sense that you probably right now are thinking of global variables. And that will make sense over time. But you can kind of guess perhaps what's inside all of these variables. If I write a PHP file and I'm passing that PHP file user input as by way of a form, well, I can get at those variables as follows. Let me go ahead and go back to Malin Rouge and go into google.html. And here again is my Google page. I'm going to go ahead now and change my action in the middle of this page. And I'm going to have it go to process.php. This file doesn't exist yet, but I am in my head about to write a, my own uh, implementation of Google. Okay, but I'm not going to quite finish it today. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to go ahead and now open a file called process.php. doesn't yet exist. I know this is going to be PHP, so I'm going to put that at the top and bottom of the file to get me started. And now all I'm going to do is print out hello world. All right, so not very interesting. This isn't even XHTML, but most browsers will behave and just show me this. Uh, sort of a poor man's web page. I'm going to go to malinrouge.com, Google HTML. I'm going to again search for hard drive and then search. Interesting. 
So it's actually intentional. But this is a message that the staff has put together that it's a little nicer, we hope, than a typical 500 message. So this message will be your friend or adversary as time passes. Um, but notice that we have overridden Apache's default error pages to offer some instructive uh, instructional hints, one of which is your PHP file is group or world writable. So for security reasons, if I actually do that ls-l, notice that process.php, just by way of, just because of how my shell is currently set up, though I could fix this another way, allows anyone in my group to write it. So I'm just going to actually change this to 644 for the moment, but I'm going to change that in a moment, and now it's just read, write, read, read. That's good enough for now. I'm going to go back here, search for hard drive, and there it is, my first, my second dynamic website. But it turns out, per our discussion of SUPHP, I'm going to do chmod 600 of process.php because I don't want, frankly, a fellow student looking at this code. I don't want some other customer on this shared host to see my code. So now notice it's read write by just me and nothing by nobody else. But if I go back and search for, say, RAM, the file still gets executed. So that doesn't need to be executable, per se, just readable by the web server. So what's now, what do we have access to? Well, there are some form fields, remember, the text field and those buttons. How do I get at the data the user's typed in? Well, in these super globals, do we have variables like the following? The get variable, by default, out of the box, even without you doing anything, stores, guess what? All of the content, all of the get variables, that is those name value pairs that were passed into the program. However, much nicer than in the world of, say, Perl or C, unless you're using some add on, even though this is what's passed in, what's stored in get, a dollar sign underscore get, is not this but rather PHP for you parses all of that and stores all of those name value pairs in what's called an associative array or hash table in uh, more uh, data structure terms. And so if I actually call this recursive print function, which we'll use especially for debugging purposes over the course of the semester, what this is now going to print for me is the following, the contents of dollar sign underscore get. So I'm going to go back here now. I'm going to search again for hard drive. Enter, and now, hmm, what's going on? Excellent. So remember earlier that we actually changed this to post method. Well, as that slide a moment ago suggested, there's this variable as well. And in fact, there's this third called request, which is sort of the lazy man's tool of getting at either get or post. <laughs> I see some uh, eager head shakes going on. Um, it combines get and post. The only thing you have to be careful of is if things are coming in from both angles, if you get cl collisions. But let's just do the post for clarity's sake tonight. Go ahead and resubmit. OK, so now we see some weird syntax here slightly. Hard drive, let me actually be a little lazy and put it also, even though it's still tonight is not valid XHTML by any means. Pre tag, which is a nice way of th seeing things in a monospaced font. Reload. And now I see this. All right, now where am I going with this? Well, if I go back to Google and do something like this, let me go ahead and add another field, like input type equals hidden. Uh, and I think the name of that thing was like HL, something like that. And then the value of that hidden field was EN for English. Who knows what it does? Who cares? Let me reload my form. Still, the form looks the same. This time, I'm going to search for RAM, click Search, and notice in this array is that other variable. So what we're seeing is that an associative array in PHP, and this is just an aesthetic presentation of it. If you could draw this with chained, um, with coalesced chaining and separate chaining, if you've taken a data structures course, this is implemented in an interesting way underneath the hood. For our purposes in PHP, from a programmer's perspective, these associative arrays, and in turn these specific super globals, give us access to a lot of the name value pairs that are submitted from browser to server. And it's these that are going to serve as the basic um, building blocks by which we take input from users and we actually do something with it. For more on arrays, I refer you to this little tutorial, which will be a wonderful reference. And what you will see in reading the language reference is that there are some very familiar constructs. The for construct, while, do, while, uh, and for each, which is another interesting one. But we will introduce these not so much uh, rote by way of the manual, but by interesting example uh, with lecture two. I'll stick around for questions, but otherwise, we'll see you next week.